Hi, my name is Nadine Terman. I'm here with Darius Dale. I'm excited for a pro to pro with him. Can't wait to start, especially on such a tumultuous day. Darius, I Love think right. the number right. one question on everybody's mind, did you buy the dip? What did you do today? Did we buy the dip? No. So we, we refrained from buying the dip today. Um, you know, and part of the reason for that is I certainly believe that in terms of the price action that we saw uh, today, you're very likely to see some sloppiness, at least in the AM session tomorrow, um, particularly in around folks who probably have not used this opportunity to get hedge or sell what they need to sell. But the reality is from a, from a fundamental standpoint, um, the part of the reason we didn't rush in to buy the dip today is we actually got some news that actually that might be negative <clears throat> for our Goldilocks view. And so, um, you know, I'll share my chart here, but you, you look at um, one thing, one dynamic we've been highlighting of late in recent notes and all of our publications was the fact that net liquidity has been quite positive uh, for the stock market and for risk assets broadly in, the, in recent months. And that's, as you can see, well, how we calculate net liquidity is a million ways to skin the cat. But I think the most simple way to, to sort of measure and map that statistic is looking at the Fed's balance sheet uh, minus the change in the Treasury's cash balance of the TGA. If treasury cash balance goes up, that means they're draining liquidity from the market. If treasury cash balance goes down, that means they're pumping liquidity into the market. And so, as you can see, we've, we're up $2.4 trillion year to date, and that's been an unabated move higher. Part of the reason we think that could continue is the debt ceiling prevents the Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary Yellen, from issuing debt in the open market. However, the thing that's, that sort of changed today, in my opinion, is something we need to measure, map, and monitor over the next few days, is the fact that the Democrats tied the um, debt ceiling uh, sort of suspension or, or, or lift to the continuing resolution that needs to be passed at the end of the month to avoid a government shutdown. And so it's my interpretation, our interpretation rather, that we're likely to see that debt ceiling uh, uh, suspended or, or lifted um, at, by the end of the month, but that actually pulls forward the timing with which the Treasury could actually start tapping uh, the debt markets again in a material way, which going back to this chart here might make the blue line, which is the net liquidity, peak and roll uh, uh, sooner than we initially anticipated. So we're, we're watching that. So you got the three M's you're talking about there in terms of liquidity. Then how should we think about, you know, one of the charts that I love to see from you every day has the implied vol versus the realized vol, right? And what are the certain exposures doing? So which ones are, we'll call it way oversold or have a super high implied volatility premium versus a discount, meaning, people are paying a ton for protection, most likely. Um, so yeah, your upper left quadrant there versus the ones in the center, which you know maybe people are a little bit more hedged or realizes closer to, to implied. How do we think about that in the context of what you're saying here is there's this new element of potential reduction liquidity, but also there's a ton of hedging going on. Yeah, maybe you, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's, there's been this persistent demand all summer by investors to overpay for protection. There's been a constant wall of worry and there's been enough catalysts, right? We've got the, the dot plot revision in June. We've got the Delta variant. We got China slowdown, Evergrande on top of that. And so there's been a lot of catalysts that have catalyzed investors to sort of reach for, uh, perpetually reach for and quite frankly, overpay for protection. And so that's that we certainly see that this morning, um, this morning when we refresh the data and we'll get the updated data tonight at 7.30. Um, when we refresh the data this morning, the median implied volatility premium for the 37 assets in this chart here was 40%, which is quite elevated. In yeah. fact, we consider anything north of 33% to be actionable on the long side to the extent that the market is, in fact, climbing the wall of worry. So that dynamic has not changed. Um, we obviously saw you know, some front running of operations expiry last Friday, and we also have a, a quarterly ops operation, or options expiry um, on the 30th of this month as well. So we're probably seeing some Fed-related catalyst-driven hedging activity taking place today. But the reality is, unless the fundamental dynamics have really materially changed, which again, I think we need some time to, to interpret um, this move by the, the Democrat Party, and if those fundamental dynamics have not materially changed, and what's more than likely to happen is what we've seen all summer, which is a, a burning off of that options premium um, in terms of dealers covering okay. hedges and, and perpetuating uh, higher moves in the stock market. So let's say we put a pin in the liquidity and it's not a problem. Right. Let's just say, OK, something happens, not going to be a problem. How do you think about allocating from here on out? So whether it's Goldilocks coming into play or maybe it's reflation um, or whatever it could be, um, it's a question for you. I know you'll be updating your numbers, but how do you play it? Are you loading into the mega cap tech and, you know, high yield or you stayed with the defensives where it seems like a lot of people already have been because those 
um, yeah. had the premium and now they're, they're closer to the realize. Like, what do you do if you actually want to be entering the market? You think that it's not going to be a problem. Yeah. You know, so I think that's the, probably the most interesting question of our current time right now. Cause of course, not okay. <laughs> the market or commodities about to collapse or not. But I think the more interesting question is, is if they don't collapse, then what do you actually buy within those, within those markets? Because one thing I've observed in our dispersion analysis of late is that there's starting to be the participation of what we would consider to be cyclical and or pro-growth um, sectors and style factors in the upper quintile of, of, of performance. And so what this chart here on the right shows is the dispersion among the 50 U.S. equity sectors and style factors on a month over month sharp ratio basis. We look at that as a proxy for institutional flows in and out of out of um, asset class, or out of these uh, sectors and style factors. And so you got 40% of the upper quintile uh, things like SPACs, high short interest, most short ADRs and energy, things that actually, you know, are pro growth exposures. Whereas the things in the bottom quintile, suddenly, you know, you blink overnight and, and this the, it, it's, it's quite full of things that I would consider to be defensive, like low, low debt defensives, obviously quality consumer staples, healthcare, dividend compounders, low beta utilities. That's 80% of the lower quintile. And so there's two things, one of two things are happening right here. And I don't know if we have enough um, data yet to confirm which of those two things is occurring. One, there's a good return to cyclical leadership in the marketplace on the other side of this correction. In fact, I would argue if that's the case, investors are using this correction to reposition their portfolios at the margins for a post-delta bounce. Obviously, we've seen the data like high, uh, high frequency data, looking at the PMIs, looking at the jobs data. They've come in in the month of August. Uh, as a function, partially as a function of Delta, and it's very likely to, that we see the data bounce in September and or October. And so that would catalyze a return, at least a temporary return to cyclical leadership of the market. The second more draconian of those scenarios is the fact that you could see some pretty material, on, this might be indicative of material oh, right. unwinding of, of consensus hedge funds positioning on the long side of defensives, which have right. demonstrably outperformed in the last few months. And they're actually covering shorts and perpetuating some of the cyclical components in the upper quintile. So I think it's too early to tell um, in the context of our, our, our Goldilocks view, in the context of the crowding analysis that we're highlighting on the slide as well. We suspect this is more just, a, a, we suspect it's the, the latter. The data will bounce, cyclicals will leave for a couple of months. But it, it very much, you know, I, I certainly don't think it, it pays to be cavalier in the absence of incremental signal. Great. And you mentioned it, and I think a lot you. of people are going to have you questions. You're a pretty big fund. Uh, what's uh, what were you guys oh. doing? Well, I sold my tra my utilities today, so I think it was across like thirty accounts. We had a, we got out of all the utilities, yep. uh, covered some shorts. We did re-enter some things in the materials and other sectors. It was in a European industrial was oversold, so definitely oversold. No news. It was just a. I think a, a reach for liquidity um, where people are trying to balance out their portfolios. And so we'll pick things like that. Uh, we had we came into today with large cash balances. And so we still maintain those cash balances. It hasn't been prudent to be, call it net short, you know, in the last year, year to date. It also hasn't been, you know, prudent to be whipping around the cash balance. So we've prefer to keep that cash balance, use it on days like today. We don't know what will happen tomorrow, but there's enough dry powder there that you could continue to enter. But you do want to take off some of those shorts, especially if you put some short term ones on. You made your win, you get out, right? And then you play for tomorrow. So, you know, we do see lots of things seemingly oversold. Yeah. Um, but I, I take your point about liquidity, but has everybody figured that out? And was that part of today? I don't think so. I, well, I think it was people around the world needing liquidity and concerned about stuff, but there's a lot of conferences going on. So, you know, Siemens came out and it said one thing about, you know, oh, there's, you know, credit is a little bit dried up for some of our clients and then boom, it's down a lot. So I think that you have to be really careful as a company these days, you're trying to just get insights out to people, but I think the market isn't giving you a lot of credit for providing those insights and will kind of take it strongly, <clears throat> excuse me, on a day like today, especially um, to the upside or to the downside pretty fast. So that's been quite interesting for us. So, you know, saw the opposite last week with Thermo Fisher, uh, one of our healthcare names. And so, you know, they talked about good things about testing and that thing was up like a rocket ship. And so there's, I think investors are, are looking for direction here as well. And so when you have this kind of, you know, data that doesn't point specifically to one thing, you've got the earth moving under you potentially with the Democrats or other issues. It could be taxes, infrastructure, 
Evergrande, you know, you name your pick, our government, another government. I think that people are just, you know, the volatility sparks are just very great. So we've just been telling our investors, you got to trade the chop. There's a lot of chop right now. got to trade that chop. Well, especially underneath the surface, right? Like we've seen a massive decline in, in the relative performance of things like, you know, energy materials, right. industrials, those kind of cyclical exposures, you know, since the reflation trade petered out in early June. And so that, that you've certainly seen a ton of chop underneath the surface of, you know, sort of, let's say the S&P around yeah. price. You've obviously seen a lot of chop in international markets as well, particularly in EM uh, focused on China. But even today, I think today was a pretty interesting uh, dynamic as well, because you, I'm showing here just to kind of um, look at U.S. equity sector and stock factor leadership today. There wasn't a lot of dispersion. I mean, obviously, real estate and utilities outperformed the market at, alongside healthcare. But when you get beyond that, most things were down in the two to three percent range. We had some things like thrown out with the bathwater. Like we had gotten yeah. out of um, MP materials in a client's yeah. account, you know, a few weeks ago. And he was like, where did it go? Why did you get rid of it? We're like, well, it just kind of trades crazy. So if you have a difficult day, that thing can be down a lot. It was down, I don't know, 8% or something at one point. I'm like, well, this is the day that I put it back in. Like if I want to yeah. be owning you know, these type of materials that like through MP materials, this is the day that I put it back in. But I think you have to be really careful because you have days like today, but it doesn't tell the story because underneath that two to 3%, some positions, some very good businesses are like, you know, up or down seven to 9%. And that's, that's a whole year return for most years. Totally. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I, this is something I've been highlighting as well is the fact that look, we've, we've, we've entered this period of messiness. And you, very clearly denoted by, you know, one of my favorite charts is our market regime probability chart. And this is just zoomed in since January 20. You know, we went from this period going back to kind of Q4 of 2019, all the way into the early part of 2020 and very obvious reflation. Then we went to very obvious deflation. Then we went to very obvious Goldilocks, followed by very obvious reflation. Now, I would argue as a function of the fact that the sort of grid outlook is clustering near the origin, which amplifies each of the four different grid regime probabilities economically, you're now starting to see a lot of a lack of dispersion amongst the grid regime outcomes. And that right. obviously puts the onus on policy and positioning uh, dynamics to really you know, perpetuate upside or downside of the market. So, right. I think that's um, really important for everyone to understand, because I think you and one of your clients made that point and you reiterated that in a note. Can you go back to the, the grid? Um, yeah, that when the data points are around the center, it becomes less about the acceleration or deceleration of that, you know, call it growth point or inflation point. It's the policy in other areas that can really drive the markets. And I think that was important for me to know, I'm gonna guess other people as well, is that when you're closer to that center of that axis, then you have to be thinking about some of these governmental moves. Yeah. Um, so putting that hat on, I think, is really important right now, which is probably why you're seeing the chart where it's like there's always usually a leader and a loser, but now it's all jumbled together. Like all the colors are now like brown because you you got no color that's standing out. You're in the brown mode. We're all yeah, mushed together. I love it. Brown mode. You're in brown mode. <laughs> perfect, perfect, uh, perfect person, place to end on uh, the <laughs> questions. Yeah, no, clients are definitely going to be concerned about the brown. Um, <laughs> So, uh, first question, uh, off the top of my head, like, how do you position when it's less easy? Like, do you want to, uh, I'm pretending to be a client, but I, do you want to, um, you know, do you favor one, uh, uh for one grid regime or another, or do you, uh, do you, does it favor just being broadly balanced? Um, you know, I, in terms of like how we've thought about this, we thought about the, 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 the number one reason we believe that Goldilocks is likely to persist, generally persist outside of a few head fakes here and there as the dominant mark regime for this sort of time period, at least through the mid to late um, you know, Q4 uh, period, is the fact that we've had favorable net liquidity dynamics. And oh, by the way, this brown jumbled mess that we're highlighting <laughs> on the chart is a signal in and of itself that investors are very unlikely to be taking a lot of risk. I mean, I do you know, all day long protocol calls with our, with our protocol clients. And since probably the beginning of July, I haven't had one person tell me that they're you know, leaning long or max bullish or totally invested. Everybody is taking chips off the table and that's been the case throughout the summer. And we've observed that um, in our dispersion analysis with the sure. persistent leadership of defensive sectors and style factors. So in terms of interpreting this brown jumbled mess into actionable portfolio construction, it probably means the market is not right yet yeah. from a positioning standpoint to go down a lot. Right. Markets go down a lot when everyone is max long, right. left, long 
and, and they got to start selling and reaching for liquidity. And oh, by the way, there's no support. That's I don't believe that that's a setup today. So this is probably more of a, a viable dip. I agree with you. And I think that, you know, one of the things that you had mentioned, maybe you have your country grids, yeah. but if you put that up, um, one of the things we do on a day like today is right, if, especially if you have huge implied volatility premiums across a bunch of stuff, and then you can find pockets like the Eurozone and other places or even Japan, right, that seems to be now actually trading in a bullish formation. But you yeah. look at these places and say, well, maybe I don't have to play US, I can buy somewhere else, like the EZU, which I know has been in your portfolios. I can buy into the Eurozone or I can buy into a specific country. And so I think that one of the ways you can get around well, what's the Fed mask, you know, or I guess the brown area going to do is say, well, can I pick a place that's outside of that a little bit? Certainly it could get impacted by these dynamics, especially, you know, you saw it overnight in Europe, but maybe we can, you know, ride that growth that we're more certain of um, yeah. by focusing our capital there. So that's one of the things that we did today is say like, okay, we don't have to just throw it all back in the U.S. Let's think more globally. Yeah. And then one thing I'd add on that is that, you know, the dollar is, is grossly overbought here. And so, you know, I, this is this is one of those times I believe it really pays to to make a call and have a, have, a, have a process to make a call, in my opinion, because you've got the dollar grossly overbought, stocks and commodities grow, or not not all commodities, but many commodities, and particularly yeah. uh, cryptocurrencies, are grossly oversold. And so, you know, if you have the fundamental view that says, okay, the positive dynamics that are associated with this brown mess, the positive market dynamics, which keeps positioning at bay, associated with that brown mess, you can actually start to take some shots as an ADM highlighter. Uh, next question. Um, oh, Dar uh, what do you guys think about the Fed this this, this Wednesday? Are they going to taper and cause a market <laughs> crash? <laughs> no. um, uh, so the, I guess I'll take the the first. Uh, I think I'll take that the first part of that. Um, it's very likely, in my opinion, just given the writing on the wall, what they've outlined in a lot most recent uh, FOMC catalysts and, and obviously Jackson Hole, that we do see an announcement of the tapering program. And as I mentioned, Powell is sitting in this very uncomfortable uh, middle position between sort of people who really want them to get going with tapering because they, they want optionality as soon as possible on the, on the policy rate. But he's also sort of sitting between the labor market that continues okay. to demonstrate a high lack, a, a low lack, of, or a great lack of substantial further progress or no right. substantial progress right. and he's and a like part of that being a lack of equality right like it's yeah. the whether it's services versus other areas and or um you know disadvantaged people and um yeah. where they sit in the labor area that's one of the problems it's that's not inclusive and yeah. so yeah so how do you take that into consideration they're going to be talking about tapering but they don't have one of their call it key three elements um checked off you're absolutely right. I mean, so in my opinion, I think the labor market is the bigger of the two mandates. The, the part of the reason I believe they moved to an average inflation targeting framework last fall was to give them space to allow the economy to run hotter than otherwise. And so in, in, and so the, in the context of that, that sort of puts the labor market in front and center with respect to uh, the determining different policy objectives. Obviously, you got the hawks on the, in and around the FOMC that are overly concerned, in my opinion, overly concerned about inflation just given our outlook for, for trending disinflation over the next 12 months. I believe Jay Powell understands, the, sort of kind of agrees with our inflation view, which takes us back to the employment. Yeah. There's a lack of substantial further progress whether you look at the drawdown in the employment to population ratio or the labor force participation rate for the prime working age adults. There's 8 million people out of work due to the pandemic when you add up additional unemployed and people who've dropped out of the labor force altogether. And then you obviously are starting to see increasing bifurcation um, from disaffected groups like Hispanics and African Americans as well. So this would be the exact wrong time to come out and get aggressively hawkish right. with respect to their statement, the dot plot or policy, which means the catalyst itself that everyone's sort of neg using this market volatility to reposition for it and short things into and buy and roll over put premium, it could actually turn out to be a positive catalyst. And here's how it could be a positive catalyst. They outline the tapering. They punted the actual uh, start of the program into December. It's 10 to 15 billion a month, not 20 to 30 billion a month, as some investors have, have called for. And oh, by the way, they actually punt the first rate hike expectation on the dot plot further into the future to signify that this uh, tapering program that they're outlining is not this sort of auto uh, correlated path right. towards the tightening of the policy rate. And so that to me would be a positive dynamic in so much that. The dot, the hawkish dot plot revision in June was a negative dynamic for recipients. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I also think, are they going to be looking to abroad? You know, we saw today uh, and all of last week, basically in the UK, natural gas prices are so high, the government's stepping in, same thing in Spain. It's a real problem. And it also means that there's been, you know, unhappy consumers. So the data is coming out that people are really concerned from a sentiment standpoint. You wonder how much that, plus the inequality of the labor market, you know, plus the Delta variant, plus there's supposed to be a really, you know, pretty bad flu season coming our way if Australia is a guide. You know, oh, yeah. does, yeah, does that come into play? Just get your flu shot. But does that come into play? Um, when they're thinking about, gosh, are we tightening just at the wrong point or sending signals that we're going to be tightening just when all these things can be kind of like hitting at the same time? It's just a question. You know, maybe that's our hope because we bought into it today. But, the, you know, the, the question is, like, could there be some like dovish elements, which we saw last time when he spoke through totally. this, such that the repositioning from maybe today changes a little bit? Totally. I, I think that's the I think that's the setup. And as you and I we've talked about this many years for many years. Is it's not necessarily about what happens; it's about the setup prior to what happens. Right. <laughs> and it's very clear. Where everybody right? else is. If everybody else thinks that's what happened with like the Spanish elections, if everybody oh. thinks somebody crazy is going to win, you actually don't have to buy protection because everyone else bought protection for that crazy outcome. Right? And the out, as long as the outcome is just moderately crazy, things right. go. You're up. good. Yeah, you're good to go. Oh, saw us at Brexit, saw us with the Trump election. You saw it with the uh, with the Biden election and, and, the, and the Republican runoff or the, the Georgia runoff. You saw you see this pattern uh, emerge, you know, throughout consistently throughout the issue, which is investors, whether they be institutional or retail, get spooked by market activity and mostly headlines, bearish headlines, into you know, sort of capitalizing Wall Street's most lucrative business. Yeah, yeah. Just selling options for shit. <laughs> you know, like, like they, they're basically saying, Wall Street says, hey, here, take this bearish headline. Mike Wilson drop, trots out his you know, fire and ice headline today. Yeah, fire and ice. Yeah, fire and it's going to be yeah, down 20% or so, okay, here we go. Yeah. You, so that had market impact. Mark, Mike, Mike Wilson is, is no yeah. joke. He's, he's, he's an excellent uh, strategist and he does a great team at Morgan Stanley. So they do good work. No, I'm not sure you agree as well. But that's a pretty wide band to be accurate from. <laughs> I know. I know. All you need Your to house do is, is either going to be full of ice or be on fire. On like, fire, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Like, I get a, a field goal no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, that's like saying as long as the kick goes past the line of scrimmage, we score points no matter what. Yeah, right. So, so I read that and I was like, oh, come on. Like, you're setting the bar pretty low here, buddy. You know, but yeah, anyways, I, know. But then, I, know. I mean, it was a, it, it was a call that got headlines, right? And it made well, I, it move the little market. Yeah. In terms of what happened today, it did what it was supposed to do. So when Walt, when the, when Morgan Stanley's desk, their option derivatives desk, needs to sell puts <laughs> to, to clients, <laughs> when they need to take the other side of their, their client's demand for puts, you know, they're selling those puts at, you know, 26, 27 sure. picks. 23, 24 bits. That's much more profitable for, for them in terms of their uh, equity service desk. So I think we're all starting to figure out how the game works. Uh, that, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean like the game can't come to an end and this might, you know, be sure, sure. Yeah, no, but I think people appreciate seeing the work that you do and the data that you're providing. You know, one of the questions, I think the last question of the day here is like, what's the data? Like, you know, you turn off this show and you go back, do your analysis, and maybe even wait overnight to get more data from overseas. What is it you're going to be looking at like most intently to say, okay, here's the setup or here's what's been going on with more clarity? What are you looking for? Yeah, so I, I think the number one thing we have to watch here is, is the dollar, whether it's the, the, the co-joint, is the dollar and high yield credit spreads. Okay. Um, so the dollar, if the dollar makes a bullish breakout, it's obviously overbought here. If the dollar breaks out to bullish overbought, to me, that's a clean cut signal of the, 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 the net liquidity dynamics changing. Like you go back to every day that we've had, like particularly last Friday, and there's been a few days throughout the summer where everything was red. Stocks, yeah. bonds, commodities, crypto, everything was red but the dollar. We saw that around the June FOMC event when they, when they hiked the hawkish stock plot. And then obviously we saw it last Friday as well. So if the dollar breaks out, that's telling me that, okay, these net liquidity dynamics have, have been favorable for yeah. keeping the dollar in a neutral state as opposed to a breakout um, are coming to an end. And you're going to see that reflected in, in, in high yield credit spreads. Because again, in terms of how this process works, right? Like I uh, <laughs> joked about this on Real Vision a few weeks ago, but the U.S. Treasury government is at the top of the global capital structure. U.S. Treasury. <laughs> yeah. you know, so if they need capital, guess what? It gets its capital. It's coming from one <laughs> yeah. of the foreign central banks. 
our central bank or us as you know private sector investors and so if our central bank is pulling starting to pull back on their liquidity provision obviously we know foreign and central banks have been out of the game for five years now that means we got to sell stuff to capitalize the government if that's a problem so we'll see that reflect in the dollar and credit spreads but until we see that i don't i believe we have to maintain this by the debt mentality great that's been fun so thanks yeah. so much for having me on today and uh, i learned a lot and uh, i'm Hopefully going to be pinging you in the morning to find out the setup for tomorrow. Absolutely. No problem. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Catch you back here next week. All right. Take care.